Now I speak in the name of the living God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much for your kind invitation to me to join you this evening, and to Peter for his welcome and hospitality here. It's beautiful. Chapel, I've never been here before, and it's a great joy to come here. Obviously, you have people living here who are wonderful gardeners, and just glimpsing out the back, and I gather there's allotments too, so it's a wonderful place to be. This weekend, as you know, churches and cathedrals up and down the land have been celebrating Her Majesty the Queen's 90th birthday. Uh, I'm Archdeacon of Oxford. I live in Christchurch uh, College and Cathedral, uh, and I'm one of the canons there. That's part of my role. And so we were having a huge civic service yesterday, the place packed. Uh, then we had Evensong, place packed again. And then we've had Matins and Eucharist today, again very full, and all in a sense revolving a little round, or a lot, around the Queen's 90th birthday. Uh, it's nice to be here with the Prayer Book Society. I've always, in my nearly 30 years now of ministry, uh, enjoyed using the Prayer Book in each of my parishes, and certainly at Christchurch, it's in use every day. The house I live in uh, was, I think, first lifted in 1662, so I always feel, I ought to feel at home with the Paradox Society, um, at least through uh, my house. The Queen, though, do we know exactly what she likes? Well, she's very good at keeping reasonably uh, diplomatic and private about these things. I'm sure she does love the prayer book. Uh, but somebody once asked her, was she high church or low church? She said, I'm neither high church nor low church. I'm short church. <laughs> I can't guarantee to be quite short tonight, but anyway, it's a special occasion. And let's think for a moment about this remarkable woman. The longest reigning monarch in British history. A 90-year-old senior citizen, yet still working a 40-hour week unfailingly interested in people, having no power to make political decisions, yet possessing the personal authority to bring people and nations together. What is the secret of her success? Six months before her coronation, she asked the people of the United Kingdom and Commonwealth to pray for her saying, pray that God may give me wisdom and strength to carry out the solemn promises that I shall be making and that I may faithfully serve him and you all the days of my life. As always, she looked upwards to God and outwards to her people. Still then, in the early days of grieving for her father, she had the poise and presence of mind to echo the prayer of King Solomon thousands of years before, which we heard in our first reading. And God appeared and asked him what he most wanted as a gift. Solomon could have asked for riches, honour, or long life. Instead, he said, Lord, you have shown great and steadfast love. Give me now wisdom and knowledge, for who can rule this great people of yours? Solomon's prayer and that of our own Elizabeth, our Queen, is grounded in the steadfast love of the Lord, the loving kindness or mercy that lies at the very heart of God, so often referenced in the Hebrew Bible as by Solomon there, and embodied once and for all in Jesus Christ. Portia, in The Merchant of Venice, famously reflects on this divine quality 
as the only true power held by only the greatest of monarchs. The quality of mercy is not strained. It droppeth as the gentle rain from heaven upon the place beneath. It is twice blessed. It blesseth him that gives and him that takes. It is mightiest in the mightiest. It becomes the throned monarch better than the crown. His scepter shows the force of temporal power, the attribute to war and majesty, wherein doth sit the dread and fear of kings. But mercy is above this sceptered sway. It is enthroned in the heart of kings. It is an attribute to God himself. And earthly power doth then show likest gods when mercy season justice. The brute power, the awe and majesty of monarchs was all too evident in Shakespeare's time. But it is mercy, steadfast loving kindness, that sets the true monarch apart from the rest. When they look to God, the all-merciful, the source of light and love, and reflect some of that same spirit in their own life and work. They are twice blessed, as Shakespeare has Portia say, for they both give and receive mercy. Coronation ceremony itself, which some of you may even have watched back in 1953, perhaps on uh, a TV, newly bought in somebody's front room, uh, was devised over a thousand years ago, and for our Queen it was indeed a religious ceremony of immense significance. You may remember she was given the orb as a symbol of power, with a cross mounted on top to indicate that her power is only because she is the servant of a greater King, Jesus Christ. The sceptre, called the Rod of Equity and Mercy, topped with a white enamelled dove, a symbol of God's Holy Spirit. For mercy, indeed, is above this sceptred sway. And at the heart of that coronation, watched by millions of people around the globe, was a secret ceremony considered too sacred to show on television. As all symbols of status are removed, and the Queen was left in a simple white dress. The Archbishop of Canterbury anoints her with holy oil, set apart not to be served, but to serve. And her calling to serve God and her people have characterised her life and ministry as a Christian from that day to this. She put it simply in 2002, I know just how much I rely on my faith to guide me through good times and bad. Each day is a new beginning. I know that the only way to live my life is to try to do what is right, to take the long view, to give of my best in all that the day brings and to put my trust in God. I draw strength from the message of hope in the Christian Gospel. They say that a good leader should do two things, point the way and say thank you. The Queen is remarkably good at both, I think, pointing the way, the way to a way of life that is about loving service of other people. Not just her calling, but potentially the calling of all of us. And she also says thank you, affirming the lives and actions of ordinary people who live to make this world a better place for others. There is no higher calling. In her 1980 Christmas broadcast, she spoke of people who give their lives in service to others perhaps through the work they do, 
or through voluntary service. And then goes on. To all of you this Christmas day, whatever your conditions of work and life, easy or difficult, whether you feel that you are achieving something, or whether you feel frustrated, I want to say a word of thanks. And I include all those who don't realise they deserve thanks, and are content that what they do is unseen and unrewarded. The very act of living a decent and upright life is itself a positive factor in maintaining civilised standards. Often in what she says, she affirms the eternal value in the smallest loving actions. In 1975, saying, a big stone can cause waves, but even the smallest pebble changes the whole pattern of the water. Our daily actions are like those ripples. Each one makes a difference, even the smallest. It does matter, therefore, what each individual does each day. Kindness, sympathy, resolution and courteous behaviour are infectious and an inspiration to others. I went this week in Oxford to something called the Oxford Character Project. Uh, it's a research project and an active work amongst postgraduates in the city, uh, seeking to produce not just thinkers, but good thinkers. Not just leaders, but good leaders. And their research has shown that the four most important virtues in leaders who are good are a sense of vocation, a commitment to service, gratitude and humility. It struck me that the Queen herself uh, couldn't be a better role model for them at the Oxford Character Project. Through her own disciplined life of prayer and service, she points the way by example and says thank you to the ordinary people she values in a way that affirms and lifts up. And interestingly, I think, for a person who is able, uh, as far as possible, to keep her private life private, and in a country, Britain, that likes to see religion as essentially a private affair, not to be talked about, Queen Elizabeth has always been remarkably open about sharing her Christian faith. She certainly doesn't keep that light under a bushel, and her trust in Jesus Christ is clearly central to her life, the mustard seed from which all else springs. She doesn't have to go to church every week, but she does slipping in the side door at Sandridge, <coughs> or going to the small church in Windsor Great Park. I was meeting the vicar from there just the other week, and he affirmed she does indeed come every <coughs> single week that she is at Windsor without fail. On holiday too, wherever she is, week in, week out, she attends church. She says her prayers every day. She doesn't have to mention Jesus in her Christmas address to the nation, but it's always there, somewhere, part of the climax of many broadcasts, year in, year out. At the age of 87, for example, she returned to a common theme of forgiveness and reconciliation <coughs> that she has known through Jesus Christ. She speaks personally of her own faith, forcing it on no one, honouring people of other faith or no faith indeed, not in spite of her own faith, but precisely because she is a committed Christian. For me, the life of Jesus Christ, she says, the Prince of Peace, is an inspiration and an anchor in my life. 
a role model of reconciliation and forgiveness. He stretched out his hands in love, acceptance and healing. Christ's example has taught me to seek to respect and value all people of whatever faith or none. We'll be needing perhaps her immense diplomatic skills more into the future as well as in the past. The future of the United Kingdom was dangled over the precipice of fickle public opinion in one referendum, and now the future of our whole continent is hanging by a thread over another. In this weekend of thanksgiving for our good Queen Elizabeth, the last words, I think, must be hers, written just a few months ago. In the last 90 years, the extent and pace of change has been truly remarkable. Our world has enjoyed great advances in science and technology, but it has also endured war, conflict and terrible suffering on an unprecedented scale. In my first Christmas broadcast in 1952, I asked the people of the Commonwealth and Empire to pray for me as I prepared to dedicate myself to their service at my coronation. I have been and remain very grateful to you for your prayers and to God for his steadfast love. I have indeed seen his faithfulness. As I embark on my 91st year, I invite you to join with me in reflecting on the words of a poem quoted by my father, King George VI, in his Christmas broadcast in 1939, the year the country went to war in Europe for the second time in a quarter of a century. I said to the man who stood at the gate of the year, Give me a light, that I may tread safely into the unknown. And he replied, Go out into the darkness, and put your hand into the hand of God. That shall be better than light, and safer than a known way. Amen. Amen.